Hello, and welcome to our webinar focused on a comprehensive genetic test called whole genome sequencing. We hope this webinar will give you a better understanding of what this technology is and what information this genetic test can tell you. If you or a close one is deciding whether to get whole genome sequencing done, it is important to know which types of results are available to you. Why don't we start at the very beginning? Our bodies are made up of trillions of cells. Within each of these cells, thousands of proteins are hard at work performing different functions that help us grow and stay healthy. You might be wondering how all these proteins are made. Well, our cells carry a genetic blueprint called DNA that is made up of four different building blocks, A, T, G, and C. These building blocks can be thought of as letters that pair up with each other and make up the genetic instructions to life. Three billion pairs make up all our DNA, which is also called our genome. The precise order of these letters is called the genome's sequence. Within the genome are segments of DNA called genes. Genes are like chapters in our genetic manual that provide the instructions that cells use to make proteins. About 99% of the letters in our genome are the same from person to person, but that 1% is what accounts for any differences between you and I. Although 1% may not seem like a lot, these changes in our DNA, also called variants, are what makes us who we are. It determines which each of us looks like and can influence how we behave. However, it can also affect how our proteins work, which can affect our risk of disease. Time for a knowledge check-in. Let's review some of the key terms discussed. Genes found within our DNA contain the instructions to all the proteins in our body. Proper functioning of these proteins are required for us to stay healthy. All of us have millions of variants in our genome that makes us who we are. However, some of these variants are in genes that can potentially cause our proteins to malfunction, which can lead to a number of different outcomes, including disease. Please take a moment to review the definitions on the screen. One way scientists can detect these differences in our DNA is through the use of a genetic test called sequencing. As the name suggests, sequencing allows scientists to read every single letter that makes up the genome sequence. Based on the reason for testing, scientists can choose how much of the genome they are interested in looking at. They can choose to read a specific gene, groups of genes, or even the entire genome, which is what is referred to as whole genome sequencing. To perform a genetic test, a blood sample containing your DNA is sent to the laboratory, where sequencing machinery is used to read the genome sequence letter by letter. Once your genome sequence is determined, it is compared to a standardized reference genome to detect any differences or variants between your genome and the reference genome. All identified variants are then recorded and analyzed by scientists to determine what effects these differences may have. Some genetic changes may not lead to any recognizable differences, while some variants may influence physical traits such as hair or skin color. Our genetic data can give us information on which traits are passed down from which parent. Our entire genome contains two copies of every gene because half of our DNA comes from each biological parent. Since our parent also has two copies of each gene that they inherited from their parents, the copy we inherit is entirely random. The trait we express depends on the versions of the gene we inherit from our parents, called alleles. Some traits, such as having brown eyes, require you to have at least one copy of the brown eye allele. Other traits, such as having blue eyes, require you to have two copies of the blue eye allele. Traits that only need one copy of an allele are called dominant traits, whereas traits that require two copies of an allele are called recessive traits. You may also gain insight into health information, such as the likelihood of developing a particular disease. 
While some genetic diseases may be caused by the disruption of a single or handful of genes, some diseases are caused by a combination of genetic, environmental, and lifestyle factors. For this reason, a genetic variant may increase your risk for disease, but other factors, such as diet or exercise, may determine whether you actually develop the disease. Genetic data can also be harnessed to predict your response to medication. The presence of certain variants in your genome may affect whether a drug may work for you and whether you may experience potential side effects. Time for a knowledge check-in. Are you aware of the reason why your physician has ordered genetic testing and how this may help? Which of the following categories does it fall under? Inheritance, health information, disease, or response to medication. These are just some of various applications of whole genome sequencing data. If you are unsure of why you are undergoing genetic testing, we recommend discussing with your physician. Now that we have a general overview of some of the applications of whole genome sequencing, let's dive into the different types of findings that may be revealed as a result of analyzing your entire genome. When performing a genetic test, there are generally three groups of findings, primary, secondary, and incidental. To explain the differences between these groups of findings, we'll follow along with an example. Let's meet Michael, an eight-year-old boy who presents with delayed language skills, problems with social communication, and also hyperactivity. When Michael and his family first came to the doctor's office, his doctor ordered a genetic test to determine if there might be a variant in one or more of his genes that may be responsible for his behaviors. The primary reason for testing is usually to confirm the genetic cause of a medical condition. Yet, oftentimes, an individual's symptoms can be quite broad, and it might not be clear what is genetically responsible for this vague set of signs and symptoms. In Michael's case, his behaviors are characteristic of a developmental condition called autism spectrum disorder. There are hundreds of genes that can explain his condition, but the role of a lot of these genes in the body is unfortunately not well understood. To try and pinpoint which of the hundreds of known genes related to autism spectrum disorder may be responsible for his condition, Michael's blood sample can be sent to the laboratory for whole genome sequencing. Ideally, one or more variants in known autism spectrum disorder related genes will be identified in Michael's DNA to confirm his observed social behaviors. If scientists find a genetic variant that can explain his behaviors, this would be considered a primary finding. This result would give Michael's doctors an idea of what therapeutic or behavioral interventions are available and could be of benefit to him. However, a primary finding is not always found. Sometimes, there is no known genetic variant to explain the condition. Although this might appear as a negative result, it does not mean that there is no genetic cause for Michael's behavior or that we should rule out the possibility of a genetic condition. As scientists, we are still learning, and it could be that Michael has a variant in a gene related to autism spectrum disorder that scientists have not yet identified. The laboratory may also find an uncertain result, where a variant is found in an autism-related gene, but the effect of this variant is not currently known. These may or may not be reported to the doctor, depending on how much information is known about this variant. As scientific knowledge and technology continues to improve, scientists may gain a better understanding of these previously unknown genetic results. What is now considered a negative genetic test result for Michael may turn into a positive result in the near future. To summarize, a primary finding is a test result that explains the reason for why the genetic test was originally performed. In Michael's case, his doctor wants to know what may be responsible for his social behaviors. A primary finding is a result that is specifically relevant to Michael's social mannerisms and language delay. Although only variants in a handful of genes are relevant to the reason for testing, whole genome sequencing provides scientists with all the millions of variants present throughout our genome. Some of these variants could tell us valuable information about ourselves that may be unrelated to the primary reason for testing. 
This additional information is broken down into two types, secondary and incidental findings. As a recipient of this genetic test, you can decide what information you would like to know. Secondary findings are variants found in genes that are associated with medically actionable conditions, meaning there is something doctors can do to help. The American College of Medical Genetics released a list of 73 genes that have been linked to health conditions that have established medical or therapeutic interventions. Detecting variants in these genes may lead to a diagnosis that would allow doctors to manage these conditions early on. This can include preventative care, effective treatment options, and even early screening. Let's go back to Michael. Since Michael is below the age of 18, his legal guardians have the option to either receive or opt out of receiving secondary findings. Two different classes of secondary findings can be disclosed, childhood onset or adult onset medically actionable conditions. His parents can choose to only test for conditions that are actionable in childhood and defer genetic testing related to conditions that are actionable starting in adulthood allowing Michael to make the decision for himself after the age of 18. On the other hand, Michael's parents can also choose to receive both classes of secondary findings or choose to receive none, based on what is in Michael's best interest. However, specific guidelines on which secondary findings are disclosed may depend on your geographic region and local recommendations. In Michael's case, Let's say his parents chose to learn about childhood onset medically actionable conditions, but not those related to adult onset actionable conditions. The laboratory staff will then look for any primary findings that can explain his behavior, and will also look into each gene that is related to a childhood onset medically actionable condition. If they find a potentially harmful variant in one of these genes, Michael's doctors can immediately start a treatment plan to either prevent or treat the actionable condition based on what therapeutic measures are available. Time for a knowledge check-in. To summarize, secondary findings are results related to 73 genes defined by the American College of Medical Genetics as being medically actionable. Think about whether you would want to know if you are at risk for any of these conditions. If you are deciding for a minor, would you consent for childhood onset and adult onset medically actionable conditions? In addition to secondary findings that are medically actionable, laboratory staff may stumble upon other unexpected information. These are called incidental findings. Some labs may offer the option to disclose these incidental results if a patient agrees to it. Some labs always report some incidental findings, and some labs report none. Let's dive into what these unexpected findings may be. For instance, the lab may stumble upon a variant that may cause a disease unrelated to either primary or secondary findings. Other diseases are usually not reported since the patient does not currently exhibit any symptoms of this disease, and it is likely not medically actionable. For this reason, the laboratory staff try to focus their attention only on the genes that are relevant to primary or secondary reasons for testing. Another type of incidental finding is when a person is found to be a genetic carrier of a specific disease. A carrier is an individual who carries only one copy of a variant in a gene that causes disease only if a person carries two copies. Let's say Michael is a carrier for a disease called sickle cell anemia. Let's think back to the first part of this video when we talked about dominant and recessive traits. Well, sickle cell anemia functions in a recessive way, just like when we talked about how a person needs two blue eye alleles to have blue eyes. In this case, a person needs two copies of the sickle cell anemia allele to show symptoms. Although Michael may never develop sickle cell anemia since he only has one copy, if his future partner is also a carrier of the same variant, then his children may be at increased risk for the disease because they may inherit two copies of the sickle cell anemia allele. 
one from each parent. The final example we will cover is in cases where a patient and both their parents get whole genome sequencing. The lab might need to sequence both the biological parents along with the patient if they need a bit more information on the inheritance of the genes. In some cases, these results may reveal that one of the parents is not biologically related to the patient. This is called non-paternity or non-maternity. This can have negative consequences if the family of the patient was previously unaware. However, this is a risk that the patient and family is informed of before they commit to testing. Time for a knowledge check-in. Now that we have gone through the different types of findings, let's go over each one by one. Please follow along and make sure you understand the different types of findings. First type of result is a primary finding. The genetic finding in this type explains the primary reason for testing. For our example with Michael, primary findings would include any disease causing variants in known autism related genes. The second type of result is a secondary finding. This type of genetic finding includes disease causing variants in the gene list by the American College of Medical Genetics. For our example with Michael, secondary findings would include disease causing variants in genes that are not associated with autism spectrum disorder but included in the gene list. The last type of result is an incidental finding. This type of genetic finding includes unexpected discoveries that are not related to the primary or secondary findings. If you are still unsure about what is entailed in each type, please feel free to revisit parts of the video. When deciding whether to get whole genome sequencing done, it is important to consider which types of results you would want to know and what their implications might be. It is important to weigh the pros and cons to decide if you want to know all, some, or none of the findings. Let's go through some of these potential pros and cons. The main benefit of whole genome sequencing is that you have the option to find out results that are personal to you. Learning about a variant that may be responsible for your symptoms may offer a great sense of relief to both you and your family. This information can guide doctors towards a treatment plan that is appropriate for you. It can also inform the healthcare team about additional monitoring, screening, or preventative measures that should be added to your care. Another benefit is that you can also choose to make a huge difference by anonymously contributing your sample to genomics research. This is an opportunity to support scientific exploration of the genome and help researchers in their ultimate goal of better understanding, treating, and detecting human diseases. However, there are also risks associated with whole genome sequencing. One is the potential loss of privacy, although scientists aim to take all the necessary steps to prevent that from happening. Another risk is finding out about a variant that guarantees you will develop a severe disease that cannot be avoided or cured, or finding out about a variant that may be related to a disease, but it is not clear whether or not you will go on to develop symptoms or how severe your symptoms might be. These results can also have an impact on your family members since they may be at risk of carrying the same variant. All of these risks have significant emotional and social impacts. While learning about secondary and incidental findings may have health benefits, they may be difficult to hear. Luckily, genetic counselors are here to help you think about the risks and benefits of all types of findings prior to the test. Meeting with a genetic counselor will allow you to consider possible outcomes and whether there are some findings you would rather not know. It is also important to keep in mind that genomics is still in its early stages. While technology is continually improving, there is still a lot we have yet to learn. Millions of DNA variants will be identified in each of our genomes, yet scientists need to be able to interpret these variants to understand if they can provide any clinically useful information. Sometimes these variants will offer insight into your health, and sometimes they may not. 
Interpreting the human genome is extremely complex, and scientists around the world are working hard to provide us with more and more answers every day. Deciding whether to get whole genome sequencing and whether you would want to know the results is not an easy decision. It may require lots of consideration as to what option is right for you. But remember, this process is entirely voluntary and will only be done with your consent. These results are confidential and it is up to you on who you decide to share them with. We hope that you found this video helpful and are feeling more informed and confident in making this personal and complex medical decision.